Yo, this your boy Miguel Hampton, a.k.a. Gelly Gel. This is Demond, a.k.a. Demond Does. What's up, everybody? My name is Damon. Train here in the building. Welcome to Common Conversations with the Odd Fellas. Start it up. No topic is off the table. Superman don't go nowhere without his cape. We came together to cry, laugh, agree, and to disagree. So let's go. Welcome. Hit that subscribe button. Run with us, uh, cause we about to be everywhere on the podcast. To the right of me is I got the man with the master plan. This is your boy, Demond. Does. Hey, this is Demond. Hello, this is Demond, aka Demond. Does aka. <laughs> uh, I, I dang it, I had a bunch of them now. I can't remember it. That stinks. Anyway, aka <laughs> I mean, let that breathe. <laughs> <laughs> There Shots. it is. Shots fired. He's starting early. Uh, let's fired. go. Y'all know how we get down. Yes, sir. Load them cannons. Let's let it loose. I, uh, <laughs> your wife was the su- was my interview uh, was my guest on my show that dropped this week. Dope. Did she did she set it on fire? Uh, of course she did. Good. It was amazing because she's the therapist with the mostest. Yes, she was fantastic. If you got brain issues, I mean mental health issues, I mean you need to talk, you need to walk it out, you need to figure it out, you need to unpack it. She is the perfect person to work with. That she is. That you know, she is. You did. Yeah, yeah. So you know, during the pandemic, she went to um, she uh, went to teletherapy, like a lot of a lot of therapists and social workers are. So that was really dope, you know. And that's gonna lead to some new shit. So some new things. That's that's dope. And I put some coins in there. Um, so I got coins in a bucket. So I don't want to hear nothing about anybody talking about me cussing. And here's the thing. I put some rare coins in the bucket so they worth more than what they were yesterday. So holla at your boy. I'm going to try to keep the cussing to a minimum today just because I might set something else on fire. Let's go. But, uh, yeah, man. So how was, so were you excited about the show? Say again? Were you excited about the show? Yeah. It was, yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah. So you launched it? Yeah. It, it dropped today. It, it dropped today? Yep. I always drop it. I always Well, I always attempt to drop. I always drop it midnight on Wednesdays. So midnight Wednesdays. Demond does the six questions. So, yep. Yeah. So last night, is there it, it is. Came out. And and with the wife, Tia Williams Hampton, else, um, oh fuck it, licensed therapist. You know she's gonna yell at me later because I'm always screwing it up. Um, Ella, <laughs> I'm not even try. I can't even get out of my mouth. You know how you can see something but can't say it. Oh yes. Yeah, that's where I'm at right LSCW, now. LSW. Right? Uh, LSW. Okay. There it is. See, I need somebody else to say it wrong so I can get it right. Yeah, that yeah, works. It, 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 you're welcome. There, <laughs> there it is. is. You're welcome. Wow. See, that's, that's the energy. That's how we play it off, right? <laughs> so that's dope. So we're going to drop the links for the Demond Dust joint um, in here later on today. So if you're watching it on, on the Facebook, whatever, you catch it out. Um, but if you're listening to the podcast, where do they go to, to, hear, to hear it? Uh, at basically anywhere you can get them. Uh, Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you get your podcast. So just D-E-M-O-D? D-E-M-O-N-D does. does. All right. So not, not not like Debbie does. Definitely not like Debbie does. Okay, but Demond does. Demond does. I never thought about that. That's gross. <laughs> <laughs> All right, off to the right of that man, we got this dude that calls a shadow because the sun don't shine. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. What's up? Nothing much, man. Nothing much. It's been a good week. It's been yeah. a good week. Yeah. Good. Getting ready to serve up some plates of food for thought. What you mm. what you feeding the people? Pandemic that that pandemic book ready? Man, I'm working on that pandemic book. I got that yeah. thirty year at we home. Gotta, we got a date. When's when's the release? I'm I'm trying to hear it. When it go to print? <laughs> What's up? Stop the bullshit. We've been eight weeks in and we talking about pandemic food. We now we in summer. Mm. Wow, really? I, I'm just fucking with you. Let's go. Let's go. Wow, it's still good. When, so when's the release? I want I want to know because I mean all all the fat people out there in the world, all the skinny people out there in the world, all the people who can't cook, some of the people who can't cook, they need a new cookbook. Got a good point. You know what I mean? There's some people in, in the house starving right now because they don't know how to cook. They got all this and extra sit, food. Don't know what to do with. And it. you said right because they extra toilet paper, so they need to use it. Right. <laughs> so when when uh, they when they get the when we get the book, I, I'm working on it. I'm still working on it. Still for finding it and getting what things locked the, in. What What's is the, the deadline? Date? What is the deadline? That's what he's asking. I, I know what he's asking me. Then give it to him. Quit Uh-oh. being vague. Wow. Don't let them back vague. you. Don't let them back you no, in a corner what? like Thank that. that. Thank you very much, you, man. man. Thank you for oh, stepping up. Hey, 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 you better not go out. You better not go out like that. No, 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 no. Stay out of it, Superman. I will have. Okay. When I am, when it is, when I am ready to have release, you all will be the first to know. So when do we get the rough draft in? 
There we go. That's a be- that's a better that's a better that's a better. That's a good question. When's the rough draft better, coming? Right? I mean, because even the calendar year ends. Oh, you're absolutely correct. How I'm, many recipes he's, he's, do you plan on having? I hadn't really decided yet. Okay. All right. So here it is. We get ready to get into phase two right. of co- we're, we're COVID nineteen, right. and Damon's still gonna be working on the book. <sighs> we know what, Damn, we know what's coming. I'm just saying. I'm going. I'm going in today. Trey Near, what up? Coming, sitting straight across. You know, this is this is my nemesis right here. They say it gets down right here. Two guns blazing. I'm a nemesis now. Let's go. <laughs> Ooh, that's oh, cool. Yeah. I mean, he got, he, got, he, got the, he got the paper plane hat on. Let's roll. You dig? I and like I can't sick. breathe shirt. I mean, you dig? Yeah, let's get it. You dig? All right. I, I can't breathe. Yeah. What's, what's the happening, word? good people? You know, Trey Near in the building. You know, Superman don't go nowhere without his cape. So, uh, we out here. Gray go live and pop off and. Uh, hopefully y'all enjoy it. That's it. What you been doing this week, man? Man, working. You know, staying out the way. Uh, always trying to improve and get better. All right. So keeping my mind sharp, fresh. Excited about my question. Hey, hey, oh, see, he, <laughs> he, 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 no, no, no. That's so, not what I was talking about. No, we were talking about last week. You had had a picture of a, a book that your friend had referred you. Yes. And I think I saw on your Facebook. Yes. That you bought it. Yes. Is that where you got the question from? No. Just so, so what, just what, what was the book? 3,000 Questions About Me. 3,000. I bought, that, I bought so, that last week at Target. Yeah. All right. So all when right. I told y'all about it, I'd already bought it. You, you didn't okay. steal it from Target, right? You bought it. Huh? I mean, <laughs> I just know motherfuckers out there protesting. I just make sure you weren't one of them looters. Oh, uh, no, nah, fam. We uh, need to uh, trade here. Trade here. Run out with, uh, with two <laughs> arm loads of books. Well, that pissed me off when he said that, right? Yeah, like, like, really everybody else was jacking TVs. He took a book. <laughs> hey, well, at least I'm trying to get better. He's like a looting nerd. Just like, did I steal that? Hey, at least I was trying to improve myself. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, self improvement. You know, I'm just saying. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get the books and the towels. I would. <laughs> What's the towels for? Well, yeah. What you mean? You can never have the not enough fresh towels. That's the bachelor. Uh, that's, that's a violation. <laughs> if you ain't got a, if you ain't got enough fresh towels, that's a violation. That's a violation. Yeah. yeah. We we gonna get this started right. Every week we start with a with a question from Trainer. Yep. And and his whole fabulous trainering. Right. Um, right. Oh, and yeah. uh, let's go. We only got one question this week, right? That makes mm-hmm. me but nervous. But everybody has to answer the question totally. Got me? So here's. So I need, so I need to write it down. Just, just here we go. Just follow me. It ain't nothing bad. It's real. So in the course of a work week, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, if you could spend the day with anybody living, who would those five people be Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Monday, Wednesday, tu- Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Who would your five people be each day? You get to spend the day with this person. Five people. Five people, Monday through Friday. And I Let's can spend go. the day. And they're alive. Who goes, and, and they have who, to be who alive. Who are you picking yes. to start? Huh? They got to be alive? Yes. Oh, man, that sucks. It doesn't suck. For me, it does. It, well, Most of the people I, mean, I, I admire are like, dead. I got, I got people, you know what I mean? But... <laughs> Like, I can't go back in history and sit with Malcolm for a minute. Start us off. We go around the room. All right. I'm going first. And, and five people and who I'm thinking about people. in the work with. I, I think it's wrong that y'all put me first, considering most of the people I admire is dead. However, there are some people out there that are exceptional, and I think that I can put them on the list. So Let, let me Hold on. Before you start, let me clarify a couple of things, too. Go One, on. I thought of the question. I haven't thought of my answers yet, in fairness to you guys. You, you so know, I don't know. You know the guy who asked the question always says that shit, right? Like, hey, by the way, I'm gonna ask you something and I ain't thought about but it. But I'm either. a solid dude. But I love so you. So you I'm know a what solid I mean? dude I got I, you. I would tell you if you know. Let's go. So I'm gonna start out with my man Malcolm Gladwell. G is an author. Love his journal. I mean, just a G is a journalist. I've got every one of his books. I listen to his podcast. And honestly, if I had to really think about it, you know, he's actually pushed me based on some of the things and how he reports and how he tells a story. It's kind of inspired me to do some other things in certain storms in terms of storytelling. My other people, cause he's still alive is um, I think his name is real name. Is it Frank Lucas? Not alive anymore. Frank ain't alive no more. Nope. Damn. Bumpy Johnson did too. All right. So we're going to keep it with Malcolm. And then I'm going to go with, uh, you know what? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to sitting with Obama for a minute. Okay. Um, Okay. I, I have to think about why. Okay. Outside of the fact that he was the first and only African American president of the United States, you know, yeah. I mean, he's a suave dude. Yeah. I mean, other than that, you know, there's nothing not to love about him. 
So I guess sitting in a room and, and parlaying with him, I will tell you, I wouldn't mind sitting in a room with Warren Buffett for a day. That's my three. And I got two more, right? Yep, Thursday and Friday. I got two more. Most deaf. Who? The artist and hip hop artist. Oh, okay. Most deaf. Okay. Man, I, most deaf, I think, is a G. Like, if you go back and listen to his music, you listen to his poetry. I know he just opened up a museum in Brooklyn that you have, you know what I mean? You can, like, he released his newest album, and but you have to go to the museum and actually see it or and hear it, which is dope. So I, I'd love to just to hear, you know, sit in a room and, and talk to him about how he thinks, how he processes, um, what his motivation is, what inspires him. My last, my last person, real talk. Man, Tia, I need you to be in the room on this one. I don't know. I really don't. I'm pushing. I'm pulling and I'm tugging. Well, push, pull, tug a little bit more. Push, pull, tug. Who who would I want to spend a full day with? Yeah. It's it's empty, cousin. But see, they got to Real talk, most of the people I admire that I want to spend more time with are dead. You know what? Y'all come back to me. Who's next? Y'all go, and I'm going to come go. back with the okay. I'll go. go. I'll go. I'll go. So Monday would be my dad. I don't know why, but uh, fairly recently I was like, you know what? I don't know. There, there's a lot that I don't know about him. So I asked him who his best friend was, and, of course, I have since forgot it. Sorry, Dad. I'm going to have to ask him again and write it down. But there's a lot of, I don't know about him, and I would just spend the day asking questions because he grew up in a very – he was. He grew up at a very interesting time. He's seen a lot of very interesting things throughout his lifetime. So that would be fun to talk to him about, and I get it, get and get you know more straight and adult answers, and you know what he's what he's learned, and I, I don't know. That'd be cool. All right, all right. My mother, for the same reasons. <laughs> um, so that's your, that's two one and two. That's Tuesday. Yes. Okay. For my mom, for the same reasons that she's the one that I. She has the entrepreneurial leanings, so right. she's the one. That, like my dad talks about, talked about it, but my mom did more of it. Sure. So that's where I get that tug from to like, I really don't want to work here anymore. I gotta figure out how to work for myself. You know, and I've, I've always had that. Little, I've always had that bug. So I get that from my mama. My third one is my niece Jordan. She's she always says she's a, she's uh, she always says I'm her favorite, and sometimes I wonder if she's right. She's she's super she's she's awesome she's an awesome kid and I don't and all the, and they all live in Memphis so I don't I get there, I got to see her grow up but I mean it, but it was just you know spotty because they're six hours away most of the time so then her brother Colin for the exact same reasons you know, they're adults now and uh, it's really cool to see the adults they become my sister's done an amazing my, my, honestly uh, th- this village has done an amazing job sure. with. With with those kids, they're they're amazing. That's they're good. they're amazing. So if if I don't say, if I forget if I've forgotten to say it, at least it's uh, recorded for posterity. So there you go. And then the last one for Friday, it has to be my sister. My sister can party. <laughs> so if I'm gonna not only go, not only am I gonna spend the day with my sister and hang out and cut up and stuff, we are going to party like crazy because it's Friday. Uh, you did because TGIF. Man. I like it. I like it. You All thought, right, look, you I'm back. Of your yeah, yeah, no, nah, I'm I'm scratching some too. So you I'm, scratching I'm some scratching already? Some. I, I mean, I had to think about it, man. You gave me you gave me some hard we shit. We right? didn't. Yeah, that was a really tough question, and you know we, I mean? we were we were not fair to him. I mean, I, 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 I'm I, telling I, you, I'm, I sit. I'm gonna, I got your back on this one. Yeah, I sit with dead people. <laughs> <laughs> shit, you know what I mean? So I'm a, I'm gonna keep Malcolm. I'm gonna keep Obama, okay. but I gotta go with Putin. Gotta oh. sit down with Vladimir. That's a G. That's a man. That's yeah. Got to sit with him. I would love to spend a day with that dude and and just really just be able to hear, listen, and soak in that his is, genius. That is, that'd be interesting. That yeah, would be really. Interesting. Hey, listen, yeah, that's an interesting. So that's I'm, an interesting. I'm taking, hey, so I'm taking Warren Buffett off the list. Okay. Hey, listen. Okay. When you pray for the rain, you got to be willing to deal with the mud, Bruh. That's a, as, as my friends tell me, I'm both aggressive and the aggressor. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, right? Okay. I mean, who better to learn to be a warrior from than a warrior? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, let's let that breathe. Yeah, let that breathe. Okay. Let's go. Yeah, yeah all right. You know, so we're going to scratch Warren Buffett and we're going to go back. Hey, that clip. Warren got <laughs> clip for Putin. <laughs> as much as I want to keep most deaf, mm-hmm. I'm going to take him off my list. And I'm gonna put my uncle Ray on there. Okay. PhD, okay. philosopher, retired from Berkeley as a professor. Wow. Um, from Panama, originally his home country. You know what I mean? 
and came to the United States. There's a lot. There's a lot of not man. Sometimes my uncle Ray and I forget that I be I, he's on Facebook. He got Uncle Ray got be almost eighty, but that sorry if you ain't Unc. Uh, <laughs> but um, that man spits so much knowledge in a paragraph that sometimes I have to look up the eight first eight words that he used. Shout out to Nikki just to understand what he was saying. Just brilliant. So yeah, you know what I mean. And can yeah. So right, right, uncle, right. Uncle Ray comes to the list. All right, and so my fifth, my fifth person, and I'm still kind of on a fence, but I met this young name, this young lady who is again PhD in engineering, electrical engineering, if I'm correct. So Angelique, if I said that wrong, I apologize. Ah, it's your sister's but name, Angelique. Angelique uh, Johnson, who who created her own startup um, called Memstem, and and she does some stuff in in biotech, hearing aids, and That's just That's I awesome. mean. I mean, you know, when I get an opportunity to sit in a room with her, and, and even if it's for an hour, hour and a half, like I can, con- I can see her brain working through her eyes. Right. That shit is brilliant. And so if I could spend a day just, just watching and listening to how she works, right, and and what allows her brain to see the things that she sees, that allows her to invent the things that she's invented and to build this 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 company. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that right there. Okay. So yeah, there so you go. got the young, got a little young, little old. Yeah. Yeah, th- those would be my five. I'm putting that down. Okay, and All the right. wife is coming with me. Damon, <laughs> uh, for me, Barack Obama. Uh, I think it just will be an just an awesome time to just spend, sit and talk with him about his journey, about um, how he navigated those waters. Gordon Ramsay. Okay. Right. Uh-huh. Okay. He, That's a good one. I know a little bit about his story, and the little bit I know is so intriguing to me and how he struggled when he first started being a chef and to come up the way he has come up and just to amass what he has. Wynton Marcellus, I would love to just sit and talk music with him. Wow. For um, Thursday, my sons, uh, just to spend the day with them, both of them, all three of us together together. Just enjoying a day, uh, sitting back, chilling, having a nice time. And then for Friday, it'll be my father. Okay. Wow. All right, let's go. I like it. I like it. All right, trainering. Yeah, dig. Yes, sir. Your so, question, your life. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Before you answer anything, I want to say something that I noticed. You had this hard-ass question, this very difficult question, and then you end up going last on Monday, off the top, man, I got to go with John C. Maxwell. Off the top. Okay. I, I'm That's always good. looking to get better, improve. And so I think he is a um, a guru in that area, in the area of leadership and development. And so I would want to sit down with him and spend the day with him. On Tuesday, I got to go with my man, Tyler Perry. I got to go with Tyler Perry. That's my dude. I love Tyler Perry. I like what he stands for. I like the energy he breathes into people. That's something that I would want to be around. You dig? All right. On Wednesday, I got to go with my man, Dr. Eric Thomas, Mm. the motivational speaker. Man, that dude, I listen to him every single morning. To be fair, uh, his podcast, like I was a little late to the party on it for some reason, so I'm a several episodes behind so every day i'm listening to an episode all right and so but yeah i like everything about uh eric thomas and that's my guy and on thursday i had a little i had to do a a a switch up on this whatever but (laughs) no because i was gonna go with my favorite quarterback ever i'm just saying you you know you you process you know this this guy throwing out the lottery um the lottery tickets but everybody knows who my favorite quarterback ever was you know if you don't know it's randall cunningham but i had i had a quick alternative uh quick on the fly and that person would be robert smith the guy that gave the morehouse students Pay their tuition, they yeah. balances. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I would want to spend the day with him uh, to to just see how he move and think and operate and what his day looks like. I I, I, I think that'd be intriguing. Those are interesting. And then, of course, you know, 
the final person has to be Jay Z. Most deaf. Has to be. I'm going to go with you on that. Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to see if I can bring a friend. Nah, you're not going to see. <laughs> you're going just, just to tell that motherfucker you bring bringing a friend. Like but, a couple of them. But, but <laughs> absolutely. Like, I got friends. You know but what I mean? Absolutely. Let's go. I would have to spend the day with Hove and just. I ain't asking. You know, just watch how he think, man. I just think yeah. how he move, how he shake and bake, you know, and uh, we probably do a little partying at the end of the night. <laughs> That's <laughs> crazy. I don't know, Yo, Jay. Tra- I think crazy. Jay t- what do we title this show, y'all? We titled this show. You dare to struggle, you dare to win. You dare to struggle, you dare to win. And so I think, I think your question, so I want everybody to know if you listen to the podcast, we do not think of these things prior to coming into the room to record this. And maybe one day we will, uh, but we are literally recording and coming together and having a conversation, which is completely random. And the only thing that's not random is us plugging up this equipment and then sitting down in front of a microphone. But the rest of it is random. We don't know what trainer is going to ask us. We typically don't know what the title of the show is going to be. Even though we are supposed to meet on Mondays and figure out a title. Absolutely. So we, Just we, air all our dirty I'm laundry. I'm just saying. Put it out there. Bro. All of it. Just all Authent- of it. Authenticity. How you just jumped on me this week to just attack me. So if you're out there. I got ADHD. What's wrong with y'all? So the just point of this is that if you're out there and you're building something and you're thinking that you always got to have everything in front of you, realize that you already have it. Um, and so sometimes walking into the room is the first step. Oh, uh, that's Showing nugget. up is the second Ain't step and then getting it done. Yeah, just doing bring. whatever it is that you are planning to do um, is the next step. So, you know, this joint is all about what? So I'm going to tell y'all where I got to. So we were, when we came into the room today, we were like, oh, what's the title? And everybody was throwing around something. Um, and I just, I, I'm sorry, I just do me sometimes. And I just was like, you know, my favorite person, one of my favorite people, of course, is Fred Hampton. Um, and he said, you know, if you dare to struggle, then then you dare to win. But and, and then the wife and I also always have these conversations about the fact that people who often persevere are often challenged throughout their entire lives. Right. Yes. And so, you know, with that, with, with struggle comes great reward in some cases. Yes. Um, but again, that's why I like Malcolm Gladwell and that relationship, because he tells those he tells those really good, good stories. And, I, and I'll tie this in because of what's been happening um, and I want to have this conversation with y'all. What's been happening in the country? Uh, what's been happening in our own backyard? What's been happening in Louisville as it relates to um, the death of Breonna Taylor, uh, George Floyd, uh, David McAtee, Xavier Williams. Um, they call him Milky in Jeffersonville at, at the hands of police. And so, you know, I've been out in, in some of the protests and, and, and hanging out with a lot of young folks. And I got to tell you, I'm inspired by them. Um, I'm, I'm inspired by their resilience um, to show up every day um, to demand something that we as a people, African-Americans, black, brown people have been demanding since the concept or the birth of this nation. And that's equality and that's justice. And then at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm watching them do a thing that I think many of them don't know how to do, but they're doing it and they're showing up every day and they're getting better at it. And so where at one point it was a, it was just loud noise, now you're seeing demands. Um, and, and I find it even more amazing because now there are people working behind the scenes um, to help or potentially execute new po- potential new policies. And I think that's the only way we, we in a sense, eradicate uh, racism. But here's the point. So I was on Facebook the other day, and then I, I want y'all to give me some your thoughts, because I want to know how y'all dealing with it, which y'all facing. So I was on Facebook the other day, and, you know, people are yammering. They're like, yam, yam, yam. They're going back and forth. Black lives matter. No, all lives matter. You know, fuck the police. No, you know, police are the greatest thing in the world. Fuck you. You know what I mean? You know, you got local businesses in Jeffersonville, like Adrian, who's parked, you know, in the middle of a protest, crying, talking about there's looters, and there's no looters to be around. And you know, she's crying because she's afraid people are going to steal her cupcakes. I, I went on one of these guys' posts, and I was like, okay, I'm not going to say anything today. Tia said, get off Facebook. So I was like, I'm not going to say anything. But then I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going on Facebook. Let me go ahead and say something. So they were talking about the protesters and they were saying, hey, we don't understand um, why they have to protest. We don't understand. You know, we don't understand. Right. We don't we don't really care. You know, America is America. America is great. You know, America is justice. The police are always right. We believe in everything that they say. And if you're if you've ever been arrested for something, then, well, you deserve it so to speak, right? This is the shit that they was, they was kind of spewing out. 
And so I wrote this thing. So I I I told I was listening and I saw I told one of the, the guy who was who was yammering out his mouth because one of the last things he said was, if you want the protest to stop, take all their unemployment checks. And so that I think that one got me. And so I said, you so I wrote him and I said, You seem somewhat intelligent. Um, so let me share with you just a few a few bits. This is what I told him. So I said, the protest is just the beginning. Um, there are times in our life when we only open our eyes to hear the screams of motherless childs and the tears and the last whisper of our fallen. And for George Floyd, that was mommy, right? And his mother was already had passed away. As I think about the state of the country, and I can't help but to see the ongoing trend that is the assassination of black and brown people by the United States government. And so... Before I say what else I said, I realized that in some of my conversations this week, even with black people, we don't even know our own history. And I'm saying we as an American history, because so much of it has been blotted out or it's not part of the common conversation. Um, and so when people are talking about this is new, the murdering of, of, of civilians um, by a militarized police, policing police department, this is new. This this didn't happen. And, and so I had to show him the trend. And I didn't go that far back. I only went back as the early 1900s. And so I did a really quick comparison. So in 1919 to 1923, of course, prominent African-American communities were burned to the ground by white citizens um, because of white, through white supremacy and white silence. So all of that happened, right? So like when we talk about Rosewood, when we talk about, um, you know, there, there are eastern parts of Kentucky, um, when we talk about Oklahoma, you know, the, you know, when we talk about Philadelphia, and I'll get into all of that. You know, all these communities were savagely burned to the ground. Black people were murdered by white folks. Um, and these were thriving communities, right? So between 1955 and 1969, prominent African-American leaders were assassinated. So when they talk about where are your black leaders? Well, literally, our black leaders are assassinated. And what I love about when people say, well, where are your leaders? You know, I think the most unique thing about when they ask that question, because they always refer to Martin Luther King. And what I found interesting is that Martin Luther King was assassinated two days after he gave his best speech. And see, we don't talk about that. You know, here's a man who who led, you know, the, who was part of leading the civil rights movement. And he did it through nonviolence, although they got their asses whipped. They got shot. There were a ton of people who were killed and murdered, yada, yada, yada. You know, but our this leader who they everybody loves was assassinated potentially, and a rumor has always been by the U.S. government in 1968, right? Along with a bunch of other people. So again, looking at this, this, this cycle and this trend, right? Took a quick look, you know, the cycle of violence that happens in America um, by, by police. So again, one of my favorites, of course, Fred Hampton, you know, and I relate this, what, what I find really interesting. So in 1929, um, on December 4th in Cook County, Illinois, Fred Hampton was assassinated by who? Police. Right. Breonna Taylor, March 13, 2020. Same. Right. Sleep in her bed. No knock warrant. Assassinated. Difference is Fred Taylor was what? He was a spokesperson for his community. He talked about what? Economic equality. Right. Here we go. Eric Garner assassinated in um, 2014. Chokehold for doing what? Selling a cigarette. Selling a cigarette. All right. Right. So they put him in a chokehold. They killed him on a corner street. Choked him to death. Right. George Floyd. Mark, May 25th, 2020, Minneapolis, what happens? For eight minutes, 46 seconds, cop knees in the back. You know, Damon can give us, I, we, Damon, you and I had this, you, you shared with me as an EMT, and it was, it, it's screeching, but the physical, what, what happens physically when that goes on? And, and if you want to tap into that, you can. It's a little, it's a little screeching. But again, aligning the trend, right? Because there are a lot of people, there's a lot more folks who have been, who have been killed by the police department. And I'm going to continue to use the word assassinated for, for a limited thing. So let's go back to Tulsa, to the Tulsa race riots in 1921, right? You know, where the United States deploys bombs, right? So we, we talk about this all the time. We're like, the United States have never done these things, right? They've never hurt black people, the country, right? Shit. We always talk about individuals, <laughs> right? There we go. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> Tulsa yes. race massacre in 1921, the U.S. deploys bombs and destroys an entire African-American community and kills hundreds by th and thousands of both women and children and men, right? In the African-American community, leaves them homeless, jobless. I mean, they destroyed it in the toilet. So here's the funny part, right? They talk about, oh, that was the one time. 1985, Philadelphia, 
police do it again with C4, right? They blow up um, an entire black liberate. It was a black liberation movement um, called Move, and and so they killed almost. I mean, they left 250 people homeless. They killed them up. So the point I'm getting at, right, is this isn't new, and 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 it is a it is a trend. At least I see the trend, and I, I hope that we as a people begin to see the trend. But much of this is allowed to happen because of public policy, because of the 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 laws that our city council and our county councils and our county commissioners and our state representatives and our Congress and our presidents. Right. 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 And so, you know, we got these kids out here marching in the street saying we want justice. And, and I believe I want to believe for the first time in our history that things might change. And so I wanted to I wanted us to kind of discuss that one. How is it affecting you? Because I'm out here. Y'all know, mash right, the fuck right, up. Right. Like, let's go. Right. Uh, <laughs> but everybody has a role, right? And so it's on the table. Don't let the crickets hit us. Okay. So. I know it was a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How has it affected me? Yeah, real talk. Um, if, I'm, if I'm being, you know, straight up, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with it. I don't know if it's, you know, because we got that visual of George Floyd. I don't know if it's because. You know, Brianna is right across the bridge in Louisville. Like, I don't know if it's because I, you know, have spent, you know, time in Georgia and I love that, that the Atlanta portion of it, the Augusta portion of it. And uh, I haven't really been to the other cities of it, but I feel like I'm connected is what I'm trying to say. And, and, and so I'm struggling with it, man. I, I literally had a, had a day, you know, where I literally had that on my mind. Versus the work I was supposed to be doing. Like, I, I I just don't understand how we are here again. I just don't, I just can't fathom it. We are here and, you know, prayer is for justice. My prayer is for those families affected to get some form of peace, some form of comfort, something that, you know, puts enough passion and courage inside of them that they continue this fight on until it's done. What does done look like to you? Where it doesn't happen again. Like, this is it. Like, we never see this portion of law enforcement, quote unquote, again. Got you. You talked about perseverance. And when, the, when you mentioned the word perseverance, I just quickly look up the word. And perseverance is, divine, is defined as... Continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failure, or opposition. The action of, or condition or an instance of persevering to be steadfast. You know, as you were going and just giving them brief history, uh, early this week I began to look up, um, you know, black people in America. Um, and it's in, it was interesting to me to find out that people of African descent have been on this continent since the 1400s. And in, in one of um, the databases I was looking up, they say that people of African descent have been here longer than the English colonies have. That before the English colonies ever came here, black people were fighting off oppression on, on this very land. I think one, for me, one of the, one of the more polarizing um, things that I've ever been a part of is when I went to Philadelphia and I had an opportunity to go see the We the People uh, exhibit. And one of the things that she says as the lady was just one lady on a stage talking through the, through the Constitution and Declaration, Declaration of Independence and we the people is, is that when they wrote the Declaration of Independence and when they wrote the Constitution of the United States of America, they felt that slavery was too big an issue to address. So when we talk about we the people, we were never the people. We were never considered to even be people at the time that those that statement was made. You know, and um, one of the things I was watching was when George Floyd's attorney, and they were talking about uh, additional charges for the other three officers, he began to quote a line from the Declaration of Independence about how we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And I think as I, as I watched George Floyd, George Floyd die, you know, I was struggling with it because, you know, I, I, I've seen all the other things that happened before him, and they didn't have the impact on me that he did. But I'm also in a different place with a different mindset, with a different understanding. So as the conversation that we had, I literally watched them kill him. And I knew how they did it from a, from a physiological standpoint that in the position that they had him on, 
his body is pressed against the ground and his, his knees, the officer's knees are in his back, thus preventing his diaphragm from expanding. So that with each time he attempted to even take in a breath, he was getting weaker. His body was getting weaker and weaker with the, with the officer's knee on his neck, comp- compressing his carotid artery and his the other side of his neck on the ground so that both of his carotid arteries are beginning to be compressed. His brain is losing the ability, losing oxygen. So he is, as he slowly begins to fade away, there comes a point where he's no longer fighting them and he's not even saying anything to them. He's not even, he's not even able to resist. So I'm curious. Okay. And and I, it's a two, I got a question for trainer too. So what part, which, which, out of all the things that happened, now I've watched almost all the videos, if there was a video. What is it about this particular time is the one that, if, what made it affect you? This particular, George Floyd's particular issue. Why, what was this the, why was this the one? I think it's because of, of um, the conversation we had yesterday with, with Trinidad's initial question. And I, and I talked about my apathy. I historically have been very apathetic to these type of events. Willing to ascribe to the idea that, you know, if we as a people would just do better, if we as a people would stop giving the police uh, a reason to to harass us or arrest us, that they would they would magically stop if we would stop with black on black crime. But this time it, it, I'm in a different place personally. So when I saw it, it had a, it had a totally different impact upon me as I begin to to consider and really look out, look at. Uh, black people in this country, there there is a mindset that is trickled down all throughout time from the inception of this country, and that's we have never been even con- we weren't initially considered to be people. So we were considered to be property. We were considered to be uh, beasts of burden. We were considered to be a lot of different things, but we were never really considered to be people. So when that mindset is passed down. So therefore, I can look at you and not even see you as a person. So therefore, things that I do to you that I would not do to a person become very easy for me to do because I don't even consider you to be a person. I got you. I got you. And I think it is it, it is when you see it in, in white supremacy and even when you talk about the events that you I, I, timelined, we were not considered to be people. So we're constantly fighting for justice and the things that are that are inherent, supposed to be inherent to us by the documents of this of this country that they say these things are inherent self-evident that all men are created equal okay that's that's an ideology and we never thought we weren't created equal but it's the the problem we're having is you never saw us as equal you wouldn't even think that we are created to be equal but you have a certain amount of power and every every time it looks like we might be able to reach a level that you're on something happens to thoroughly annihilate the attempt. You know, one of the things that I've been really starting to look in and really starting to get a better, under, try to get a better understanding of is Black Wall Street and what happened there. And the fact that they are not a, a thriving community of black people and businesses and things where they're independent in the sense that they're not dependent on, quote unquote, the white man for these things. They're able to be self-sustaining. And they're not only able to be self-sustaining, more and more people are becoming self-sustaining. And then because of an accusation, it's utterly annihilated, wiped out completely off the face of the earth by the government. I don't know that anything of that magnitude in that particular way has ever been created since. Not that there isn't people, black people who are wealthy. Not that there aren't black people who are entrepreneurs. Not there aren't black people who've had financial success and business success. But when you think of the dynamic of Black Wall Street and what it what it was, I have not seen that. What you about to, big guy? Wow, can you ask that question again? <laughs> <laughs> Just, I mean, with all the with all that's going on, how's it affecting you? You know, where where where's your position at? Um, what are your thoughts? Just just you know, where you at? Um, it's a lot. There, there were there are stretches where I wake up angry almost every morning, like really angry, and um, it's just it's maddening. But you know, the, I got the little people, so they help, and uh, I I spent you know I've spent a lot of time with them, and uh, just 
you know, hugging on them, you know, loving them as much as I can because it's because pretty soon Georgia's probably not too far away and Joel won't be far behind it. I'm going to have to, you know, toughen them up, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, I, and I, I'm just not, I'm not looking forward to doing that. You know, it's, I shouldn't have to. My kids should be able to grow up just like every other kid. And, you know, honestly, kind of the way I grew up, to be honest, they're going to, you know, because I didn't, I don't remember having that talk. You know, uh, like the, the the one that shook me the the one that shook me the most was Rodney King. I've told my wife this story because I, I used it to make her laugh, but because I remember, I, I remember, I'm like, wait, what? What could one? What could he possibly have done to have seven dudes kick his ass like that? And two, there's seven of them. Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> True story. And, and you know, and Real I said fun. that I said that in my physics class, and the guy next to me, this big corn fed guy, I'm like half his size. I'm I was I'm picture me with forty pounds less on me. You know, he was I think he was an offensive lineman on the football team or whatever. And he says, Well, he shouldn't resist it or something like that. And I'm like he's like, it, you know, being a cop is dangerous, you know, that that kind of rhetoric. And I looked at him and I'm again, I'm not big now, but I was i I'm forty pounds smaller then. And I looked at him dead in his eyes. Said, "If there were seven of me right here, right now, we would beat your ass barehanded. They're trained. They had weapons. How do we avoid this in the future? Like, so I'm, I'm I, you know, I think about it all the time. So, you know, somebody posed the question. You know, um, keep forgetting my kids are it, watching this. Hey, that's all right. Let them watch. They, they, this is it's a good time for them to understand it, right? To have a conversation because that's something else that's coming out there. It's like, how do you talk to your kids about this? This is real. It right. ain't going. And, and the thing that is, I think mostly is, it's not going away anytime soon. They, what did they? They just arrested a little kid in New York for selling candy on the subway. What? You know what I mean? Like this is happening over all over the country. Like I, I think some of us only watch what's happening in our backyard. But if you look what's happening across the country as a whole. Right. I think they tear gassed the kid at one of the protests. Mm -hmm. Right. So our kids are, are, you know, it used to be, I guess, at some point in time. And I don't think it's ever been. I think black kids have always been, you know, a target. And I think sometimes it's more so today than it was yesterday. And how do, so how do we how do we protect our children? Right. How do we protect ourselves? And somebody asked a question the other day is like if you were standing out there and, and you saw Floyd and the situation with the cops, what would you stop it? And and I don't I don't know that I would or could. I'd like to think I, I would. I'd like to think I would I would take that position. But I also know I'm I'm taking a position where I'm probably gonna lose my life for a stranger. Right. You know what I mean? Um and I had to honestly process that. Now, if it if it was one of the homies, if it was my brother, if it was my wife and my daughter, you know, I can say pretty quick, ninety nine percent of the time I'm gonna act real fast. Right. But I think about that. Like we were marching today in in Jeffersonville, and and it, Jeffersonville is a small town. It's pretty safe. I mean, the first time we marched, of course, the state police showed up in riot gear for a bunch of kids. I thought, how 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 ludicrous that you would show up f to meet your citizens in the middle of a street in full tactical gear. So I, I ask. How do we change this? And I know it's through policy and everybody's going to play a role. And I've gotten a lot of calls of people saying, hey, how do we, what do we do next? What do we do next? But I'm just curious, you know what I mean? How do we protect our children? How do we protect ourselves? And, and would you, do you think you would honestly step in the way or not? Like, I'm curious. Ooh. I'll, um, be, I'll be honest, no. Um, and I'm not, I mean, that's just what, I'm just being honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah a, it's, it's, it's a stranger I, and I'm not sure. I'm not going to pretend I'm not, I'm going to pretend I'm sure what I would do because right. I know if I go to save him and I don't know, like, if, if, again, like he said, if it's somebody that I, that I know and love, we're going down in a hail of gunfire. It's just what it is. Right. But on, for a stranger, when I got babies at home, right. I, I no, Right. No. And I'm not ashamed to say that. Right. So one of the things that I've always um, thought about, uh, these types of questions that you just asked is that it's easy to say what you would do and wouldn't do when you're not in the situation. <laughs> right. Right. Real but, talk. but then when you get in the situation, right, you never know what might move you. You might be thinking of your kids, right? You might be thinking of your neighbor, your brother, you know, your friends, community as a whole, the country as a whole. You might be thinking of them and tackle the cop, right? Right. Because it's about progress. Sure. Right? Sure. And though you might not live to see that progress, 
you stood for something, right? So you don't know, but it could be exactly what you described. No, you know, I got kids at the, it might be that. And nobody's going to be mad at you for that, right? But what would I do in this situation? I really don't know. Yeah. Because you might get in that situation and something just move you into action. Like your logical, reasonable self would sit this one out on the sideline and be like, uh, I'm not going to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, real talk. I, I don't want to die today, right? right? Right. But something might move you into action. Next thing you know, you in there battling the, the, the law man, John Law, and probably die. You know, you, you, you just said something that, that just sparked a thought in me. The, the fact that we have to rationalize, I don't want to die today. That before we do anything else, we're looking at the situation. We may not know, may not know all the parts and pieces of the situation. But the, the, one of the first things that's going to cross our minds is that I don't want to die today. Right. That we're, we're, we're predisposed to rationalize the situation or seek for some rational perspective before we step into action. And you're right. I don't, I don't know that I would or would not jump in. Right. Now, if it was one of you all, my sons, my wife, the girls, without, without, I think I would act without even thought. All right. Simply because, and, and back to my point, you know, I am now medically trained. So there's one thing we're taught as EMTs is mechanism of action and scene size up. That you're assessing the scene as you're approaching it. So you can map out and decide how you're going to respond. And based upon what you see, you can, through mechanism of action, have a baseline understanding of what, how you're going to treat the patient when you get there. That's ingrained in me. All right. So I'm constantly in a mode of, of assessing, constantly in a mode of when I, when I see situations unfolding, what's going on. And I think that for me, as I look at George, George Floyd, was I couldn't turn that off. Got you. Got you. I, I could not turn the EMT in me, the nursing school in me, all the medical knowledge I know, everything that is, that's taught that I've been taught and how to save life. I couldn't turn it off as I watched this man's life be taken from him. All right. Ex- and it was like an execution, medieval style. The one cop, his additional cronies, and he's bound and being executed. So how do we how do we avoid being killed in the future? I think I think what's happening right now it is is part of that process. Trainer said a few minutes ago, "Here we go again." And the first thing that crossed my mind when he said it was this, what do you mean here we go again? It hasn't stopped. It's changed forms. True story. But it's the, it's the same thing. And now, even more so now, with the advent of te- technology, not only can we watch you as you're doing it, but now the, the social response is much greater. All right. It was, it, it did, my, it did, honestly, it did my heart good. I was watching the Daily Show with Trevor Noah, and in, in his uh, broadcast, he showed the other countries in the world who are standing with us in solidarity. That it happens to you, it happens to us. Right. <clears throat> to see not just black people, and 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 it's not that white people haven't always been there; they've been there. They've played a part in in the movement in the progression, you know. And I don't think I don't I don't believe all cops are bad. Right. I don't believe all white people are bad. Right. I don't believe that all cops are seeking to oppress and to not show us justice as black people. And I don't I don't I don't have those absolute extreme ideas. Right. Right. But does it exist? Does it exist by policy and procedure? Are police protected by the system? So or when they do those, things? I'm going to argue with you real quick okay. because I am that person. Right. So you tell me that. I'm not going to say all cops are bad. However, if the system that they operate and govern by is flawed and is systematically racist, how is that role not bad in itself? Right. If the mayor and the city council can negotiate a contract with the police union that protects them when they commit police brutality and discrimination and they may or may in or kill, grope, destroy, defame, discredit, falsely accuse people of color. How are they not bad? I'm not saying the individual, but the idea and the construct in itself. 
I agree with you. I absolutely agree with everything you just said. My perspective. I got you. Was more on based on not every individual cop will take advantage, will seek to destroy. Will, will do the most. Will, will operate in what everything you just said. And I, and I say that once again, and going back to my experiences, it's, I'm a six foot five black man currently rocking 400 pounds plus. I get eyeballed just about everywhere I go. But my experience with police, my experience in, in situations where I've been pulled over, it's been night, and there's this cop walking up to, back to my car, black and or white. I've not had those experiences. So I can, based upon my experience, not speaking to the system, yes, the system is flawed. Yes, there is systemic racism. So, I, I, I don't disagree with that. But my individual experience. I got you. With individual police officers, I've not experienced those things. And I think that led to, to me at a, personally being apathetic. But I, I'm no longer apathetic. I'm no, I'm no longer willing to to so casually turn a blind eye out of convenience, comfortability. So what are you willing to do now? I'm figuring that out. Mm, Okay. Right. Currently I'm writing. You in the same role? I don't think all cops are bad. In fact, my, my family and I, we've had an awesome experience with one. If I'm being straight up, he was white. He was outstanding, but I think it was during a tough time and but I think his heart was different. And so to your question, you know, how do we make it better or how do we I don't I don't know that answer because I don't know if you can I don't know what kind of tools or, you know, test or research or evals or any of that. I don't know what can be done to check a man's heart. Not let him be a cop. And not let him be a cop. I don't know what kind of tools that so get- so how do we change how do we change the contracts and the system and the policy that allows them to to police in such a fa- matter? To, no, fuck that. They're not even policing. They're 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 uh, militarizing. They're they're engaging in war. Right, but you got to check some of these people's heart. And, it, and how you gonna and check a heart when the system allows them to do it? That's what I'm getting at. How do you know that that cat is evil deep down inside? You don't till he kills you. Exactly. But we so got a what, trend. But you ask me. How but we, we, we got a trend. And so I'm saying, I don't know how, because I got you. you can't, I don't know what you can do to check a man's heart. Here's the problem. Every man is a hero in his own story. You know what I mean? So even checking his heart, because I've, I've had to, I, I have quite a few white friends, and I recently found out some of them are wildly racist. And I'm just like, I, it, it's been that's probably been the hardest thing for me to wrap my head around. I'm like it's so unnecessary. All right. You are justifying this being okay. This could happen to me or my son, you motherfucker. Oh. <laughs> Real talk. Yeah. Okay. Like I've been on the other side of it. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like it just and it, I the the hardest thing I it's I it, it's I don't know if I processed everything else, but it has hurt so bad. It, it's, it feels like a uh, betrayal or it's one of those, how did I not notice this sooner? The signs were all there kind of thing. You know what I mean? I'm just like, I'm still processing some of this. I'm just like, I just, right. it's so unnecessary. But if something's rooted in somebody's heart, though, it, so might, like, it might slip past y'all you. Y'all seen this movie, 12 Years a Slave? Yes. All right. And, and, and. As we're having this conversation. I have not, by the I, way. I haven't seen it yet either. All right, so I'm the radical one at the table. You are. We know this. Yes, mm-hmm. the wild card. During the movie, there was a particular time that the main character, the main slave character, I can't remember his name, and it just came to mind. Um, his Etch- master, Etchford. Etchford, okay. His yep. master came out and told him, stand on. here until I come back. Yep. Homie stood there for almost an entire day before his master returned. As we're having this conversation about good cop, bad cop, and checking people's hearts, that's what I feel like we're doing right now. Like, we're having, like, and this is a really soft conversation. This is a hard conversation to have, period. Yeah, 100%. But this is a really respectful conversation to a bunch of motherfuckers that just killed a whole lot of people during a pandemic. I got, I got, you know, I got friends that are cops. Right. And I'll sit here in a room and I'll tell it to them. Right. Right. If you allow your office, your partner, 
to kill a black person or to say racist shit or to do racist policing, then you just as fucked up as they are. You are, you are complicit. Right. I agree right? with that. And to uh, continue to allow that, if I have to, if I have to be a, I ain't afraid much, but if I have to, if I have to walk out my home and see you as potential danger because I don't know and I know that you're protected by the law, that's some wicked shit, man. Right, right, right. That is slavery. Right, right. That is oppression in its core. Right. I don't feel like we should have to decipher a man's heart when his job says that's a job, homie. Right, I'm with you, but they. Right, not, if you a killer, you a killer, whether you got that badge or not. But let's not give them badges. That's the. But how? I mean, I'm just. I'm saying. with you. I'm with you. Like I agree. I think he's trying to figure out. You know, okay, so let's not give them badges, but how do we make that determination? Exactly. I don't know. I mean, so here's the other question: How do we vote mayors in who will pass policies that are economically uh, racist and or disparaging the black people or the black and brown people in the community? That's the same thing. We still killing a group of people. We're just doing it in a different math. Or a different way, right? You're you're absolutely correct. So right. I'm I'm just I'm you know so this you know, I didn't explain how this shit is affecting me. <laughs> right, 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 right. We see. <laughs> so let's let's have that. You know what I mean? How is it affecting you? Oh, I'm fucking angry as hell. Like I, I really I'm at the point where I want to hit the F5 button on the fucking on the fucking on America. Like I'm really there. Like I I feel like we need to reset this shit. The Constitution was never written for us. Never. Uh, the police was never created for people of color nope. no, or or the indigenous folks of this country. I think we have black people who are elected in office who sit on their ass and and had the opportunity to change a lot of the policies that are discriminatory, right? And haven't done it. I feel like there's a shitload of white people right now, and I love my white friends, but a lot of the motherfuckers is on a bandwagon for the first time. And I appreciate it. But I want to move beyond conversation. Trey Near said, here we go again. This shit is, it's, it's been a constant, it, this has been a continuation. It is a trend. It is a habit. It is a nature of this country and of many of the people in it. The Klan didn't go away. They put on badges, and they got elected in office. They put on suits and ties. They changed policy. They dictated who had power and who who was able to gonna have wealth, who was able to have riches, who was able to have land. These kids are out there protesting, to be honest, because the four of us couldn't figure it the fuck out. Real. Right? Apathy. How do I'm I'm because this is a live conversation and I'm gonna be me and I you know I love you. How the fuck? And I'm and this is for a lot of black people and a lot of black women, a lot of black men. Matter of fact, Tia just said we should have some black women on here. We're gonna do this. How is it that black people have apathy in this race in this race thing as if it doesn't affect and this is rhetorical. So if you're listening and you have friends and you feel that way, for me it's a question. Because there's a lot of people out here who've been fighting and dying just so that we can have equality. Just so that we could we can we could make an honest living so we could own a home so we weren't being you know you know people weren't 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 out there taken here we, uh, you know let me address that as you're talking it's the thought that really comes to my mind because I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about my life as you're asking as you're making this statement and ask this question how do you have apathy we taught that this the civil rights movement and the progression of black people and martin luther king's juniors and malcolm x's their sacrifices and their death was so that we could have freedom, the, the freedoms in this country. And my traditional historical stances was that, and I, and I would make this statement, they died so you could have the freedom and what have you done with it? So my thought growing up was, if I go to school, if I get good grades, if I'm not, if not caught in the crime, I'm not on drugs, and I, I get a good job and you know I, I make something of myself according to the, the dictates of society, I have taken the freedom that others have died for me and I've done something with it. Now, the reality of all that other stuff that's going on right now, at a certain point, oblivious to it because it doesn't impact my world directly. It's something I see and I'm able to distance myself from it because I'm not on drugs. I'm not a criminal. I'm not this. I'm not that. And I grew up in California in the height of the, of the gang wars in the 80s. I'm not a gangbanger. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not what society says negative black people are. Right. And I'm not Cliff Hustable either, but that's where I'm. That's the direction I'm trying to head. And I want to be like that. So you're you you see it in a sense. I'm just, in, in I'm this, just in, asking that you're not white society stereotype exactly. of the African American or black man. Exactly. I'm mm -hmm. not the stereotypical. Okay. I'm not what they say the stereotypical black man is. But what is what is it to be black in America? As Are you man, asking me that? This is something. As what is it to be a black man in America? 
growing up in a fatherless home with my mother who could never tell me what it was to be a man, period, and seeing a variety of different men around me, how, how do I, and, and my, mother's, my mother's perspective was this. She used to say, you're going to speak the king's English as long as you're in my house. So my mother taught us to speak properly. And this is when they were doing Ebonics and they were beginning to teach Ebonics in school in L.A. County. I was in California when they started that. And my mother was like, you will never talk like that. I got you. So my, um, and it wasn't to kowtow to anybody. It was just so that I could be in the best possible position to interact with the, the world that she was about to send her black children into. So my mother grew up in the 50s. So she understands certain things. But I didn't grow up with, I didn't grow up with my mother's fears because I'm now a product I'm 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 a product of post civil rights. So there's certain things that I that I that my mother dealt with that I didn't have to deal with. So I don't I don't carry her perspective per se because she's raising us to be productive in this world, not necessarily to be quote unquote white, which I was accused of as a child because I, I dared to speak properly and dare to be educated and took education serious. So I grew up with the idea of being black was being the, to be black by considered black by black people. I had to be semi uneducated, not care about education, talk like I didn't have any sense, walk around with a militant attitude and angry all the damn time. And the, these are the things that mm. in order to be black, this is what I needed to be. And okay. so I'm trying to figure out where I fit in the world because not fully accepted by my white friends because I'm black, but not fully accepted by my black friends because they think I'm too white. Now that I'm a man, the question still sits in my head. What is it really to be black in America? I have a better understanding of my history, the history of my people. I have a better understanding of how I feel. I'm in a, in a different position to see things that I didn't see when I was 10, 11, 12, 14. Respect. I know things that they didn't teach me in school, nor things that my mother thought to engage me in conversations in either. So for me, it was easy to be apathetic. Okay. Because I'm looking at my own people saying, I don't want to be like that. So you seeing your own people through the eyes of, I got you. So yeah, I got you. I'm with you. I'm curious. So train here, jump. What's it, what's it for you? What's it like to be black in America? That's thank you. That's dope. But wow. yeah, I'm I'm with you. Wow. So yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, a tough question because for me, I never in in my mind in my thought process, black is black. You know, if you black, you black. Mm-hmm. I never saw it any other way. So I understand what he's saying um, as far as speaking proper and you know whoop de whoop de woo. But if you got black parents. You're black. Yeah, right. <laughs> if you got one right. parent that's black, you're black. black. <laughs> you know, if you have, you know, um, you know, all, and I don't know all the, listen, the ethnicities, y'all know what it is, but you're black. That's gotcha. not, I never saw it any other way. And so that's my perspective. I never, you know, in my mind, I never thought about, well, what's it mean to be black in America? I never thought about those things coming up because I just, you black. You know, I just kept it like that. And I, listen, I'm not this guy that I'm simple, right? I'm a simple guy. I like simple things. I don't try to make anything complicated. That's not the world I live in, right? And so you're black. I got you. <laughs> I got you. Experiences define things for us. We, and, we realize that. And let me add one more thing. To that. I, I, that's real. No, because you, you, you actually brought up a good point. I grew up in California as typically – one of the only black people in a room full of white people. So I learned how, and my mother's emphasis, how to speak, speak, interact, not to hide who I am, but how to operate in this, in this environment. And growing up, I, it was, it was interesting because I was never really comfortable being in large crowds of black people. Didn't have any athleticism. Even I was the, the tallest black person in all of my school. Right, right, right. You know, but I, I'm not an athlete. So, you know, when the coaches was like, oh, we need to get him on the team, we get him on the team, and they get me on the team, and they see I've got no skills, 
you know, all of a sudden, you yeah. gotta relax. <laughs> yeah, you gotta relax. For real, real talk. You gotta relax. Real talk. Because I'm one of the few black people in a predominantly white, that's, that's white school system and environment. Right. Get that brother off the team immediately. Real talk. That's like, real. Like, who just yeah. did this mess? That's real. You know, so, you know, I did have an aptitude for music. Yes. Even in music, I did not start getting really into the music, black music, until I was an adult. Because my mother was, she was into the arts. So I listened to classical music, Beethoven, Bach, Chopin. Those were the people I listened to in music. Mm. I was in band, symphonic orchestra, where we played those type of that type of music, you know. So in in the I didn't really get into rap from the eighties until I was an adult, right? Well beyond the eighties. Got you. Because one, my mother's been saved and in church all her life, so therefore it was all my life too. Got right. She wasn't playing that kind of music in the house. That's right. I didn't have them kind of friends. <laughs> <laughs> Real talk. I just right. didn't. All right. So my exposure to it is, you know, Friday night videos back in the day and it's limited. So once I, I leave my mother's house and I'm an adult and I start making, making my own way in the world, then I, I, I get exposure to a whole section of my own culture mm. that right. I've, that I've been systematically taught to view negatively, directly and indirectly by other black people, by other black people. All right, we're going to roll. Hold on, because cause Demond, I need you to tap in here, bro. I mean, blackness for you, black in America. What does it mean to be black? I'm just curious. Y'all got me. I'm <laughs> I'm just asking questions. I'm, I'm You know what I mean? I know what I feel. Know, I know my thoughts, my opinions. And I think that's the love about being at a table with four brothers that come from f- different areas with different experiences and having this conversation. Yeah. Because we're not monolithic, and this is showing it. Right. Right? Right, absolutely. I'm, I'm, yeah, go. I mean, I'm curious. Growing up, I had a similar experience as Damon, actually. That just, like, like what I, and even, what I, I think I mentioned this before, like, it just timed perfectly where, both, you know, both my parents are professional, uh, both are in the medical field, and I saw the Cosby show growing up, and then a different world. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> I didn't have, I mean, I, um, I understood that those stereotypes existed, but I didn't have that, I guess, you know, that, all black people are bad, but basically you're black, you're black. Yeah. You know, that's how I felt about it. Yeah. And, uh, but I did get teased because for the same reason Damon did, because I spoke proper because I'm afraid of my dad. Yep. <laughs> so, so I did get a lot of that and it, and I had some of that you know, still do to, to some, to some degree where, you know, just, I just don't feel, I, I very rarely feel comfortable in, very large groups and very large groups could be three, four, five people. So can I share? Please. By all, all means. means. <laughs> you know, it's I crazy. Feel, Cause I feel like our answers wouldn't satisfying to you. <laughs> no, nah, it's not even satisfying. I, I think y'all introduced me to a, a purview. Okay. My experience ain't that. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. I love my fucking Jay Z song. Still nigga. Right. Because it, it was, that's my experience of being black in America is that I am the enemy of America. My experience of being black in America is that I am a tool to be used for their wealth, right? That, that, is, that, is, that has been my experience to be black in America. Now, let me tell you how I feel being black in America. You know, my people taught me really young that I was a king. You dig. And that I was to destroy all my enemies. And I was to build a kingdom. That's right. Protect my people, feed them, and be free and independent. So with that being said, I remember I remember this period, 6th, 7th grade, Marysville, Ohio, kid named Scotty, good-ass friend. We go on to lunch. We used to hang out, play video games together, do the damn thing. And at lunch table, now, mind you, when I got to Marysville, they always called me nigger and chased me home until I whipped somebody's ass. My mama told me, she said, I remember that day. They used to chase me home. I would cry. They would beat me up. And my mother pulled me aside. She said, baby, you know you can hit a white person. I said, huh? She said, you can hit a white person. I said, I can. She's like, you ain't going to get in trouble. I went to school the next day and whooped ass. <laughs> I can't stand you. I, I could not stand this guy. They was never going to ever put their fucking hands on me again. I didn't care if he was an adult or a child. That was me. That's sixth, seventh grade. Wow. And I'm sure some of them kids at that school remember that day. Mm. 
You now you was in the red. That I'm day. a fast forward. Nah, yeah, I was in orange. <laughs> that ain't orange. <laughs> that, that's orange. That's, that's orange. Red. That was orange. <laughs> wow. He got up. So that's crimson. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember my friend, and you know, just when I I felt like I could settle in this environment, right? I had friends. I could trust people. I could engage. This this life was about to change. Right. My white friend sits down at the table and says, "You still a nigga." Wow. Fuck me up. I couldn't even eat my lunch. I remember going out on recess, though. And I said, I'm still a nigga. Why are you going to call me? And I, and I remember I, face to face, he wore glasses because, you know, you're not supposed to hit a man with glasses on. Uh, oh, is that the rule? <laughs> <laughs> is that the rule? Hey, that, that was the rule. Oh, hey, I hope, sure hope that so. Is not the, that is not a violation. I and sure I, hope so because I talk a lot of smack. <laughs> you know, and I wanted an answer. I wanted an honest, an honest answer from my friend. Right. Why he would call me. What would cause him to look at me and say, you are still a nigga. Right. And I asked him, I said, why would you say that? And he looked at me and said, because you are. And I punched him dead in his fucking face. And that's how I feel about America. Today's times, what I've watched with the, the, the militarized, the governor and the mayor in Louisville taking and bringing the military into the West End was uncalled for. I've seen it through history, watching it on television, reading books. And I said to myself, if you move the National Guard into Louisville, you are, this is an act of war. Historically, we've seen it. And not 48, 24 hours later, man is dead. Investigation is rolling out and we still can't be sure what the engagement was. Right. Black in America. You know, I, you know, as much as I'm a king, I realize I'm also a target just because of the color of my skin. Right. I've gotten tickets in front of my house in Jeffersonville. Uncalled for. Cop couldn't even tell me what the fucking ordinance was. That's how Ill- Ill- illiterate and ignorant his ass is. You said in front of your house? In front of my house. Parked in front of my house on a Sunday. Right. And then he wanted to debate with me. Mm. So my relationship to police is probably much like a lot of other folks. I got to know whether I got to be on the defense. Oh, 100%. When they pull me over. 100%. When they're walking down the street. Are they looking at me as if I'm a target? And I think a lot, and, and, and so I love you guys' perspective because racism, like I know that there was a civil rights movement, but fuck, there was a KKK member in my high school. We almost duked it out. All right. Right? I had principals try to send me to jail for some shit I didn't even do, wasn't even in school that day. Black in America. All right. You know, so I love y'all perspective. Yeah, I hang out with the homies because I didn't grow up in the hood. I grew up in white suburbs, typically the only black Afro-Latino dude in the space, or at least the one (laughs) brave enough to be like, hey, I'm here. (laughs) You know, relatively articulate, even though I cuss a lot. So now so 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 now that I got an understanding, a little more understanding of the question, um, one thing that irks me. It troubles me. You know, I hate it more than anything is when you get pulled over. Black and American. And for that first split second that you see them blue lights in your rear view mirror. Bruh, black and American. Talk. And then you got to remind yourself that, you know, oh, I'm trained here. I ain't doing nothing wrong. Black and American. Bruh. You know, I ain't doing nothing wrong. I'm cool. Like, I'm good. My reputation is solid. Like, bruh, you dig? For the first few seconds after you see those blue lights, you get that pause that <clears throat> in your stomach. Mm. And I hate that. You know, it's interesting. Um, several years ago, they were passing around this. This thing was going around about, you know, if you get pulled over by the cops, you need to do this. You need to answer this way. You need to you know, not be aggressive. You need to just answer the question. Don't ask them why they pull you over, blah, 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 blah. And I was thinking to myself, why? Why do I have to really, why do I have to sit here and tell my sons, teach my sons? this um this code of behavior if you will and they could may not have been even been doing nothing but just simply because they're black in america I, i'm aware that their pre- the perception about them is that they are violent they are a threat and they don't even have to say anything they are that period that is how they are perceived when they walk in the room no matter how articulate they are no matter how educated they may be no matter how well spoken they are, no matter how eloquent they may speak, but the minute they step into the room, the perception is, is that they are a threat, 
Oh, that's the scariest brother. They are. Oh, 100%. That's the, you know, you do realize. So first of all, these motherfuckers ain't my king. I do speak their English. Mm-hmm. But they ain't my king, and I will never speak their king's English. That's me. Okay. But you do realize the person, when, when you can speak their language, and you understand their rule of order. Facts. When you understand how they how they create, see, they create policy to play with each other and to keep us out. Right. Talk. That's that's their rules of engagement. When you understand when 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 the brother understands that, that's the scary. They ain't scared of the gangbanger. No. That's our soldier. See, they taught us to look at our gangbanger and say they ain't worth shit. Right. That's our soldier. Cause them bros, they ain't go to school, but they highly intelligent. They know the art of economics right. on the ground level. Mm. They know the art of, they are, they, they militarized. They OGs, unfortunately, they go to prison and all that other shit. But they taught us to look at them different because they want us to look at them different. They still brothers. They still black. They still black women and black men and black children. That's right. Mm-hmm. The war on drugs, I mean, come on, let's be honest. The United States fueled the war on drugs. Most definitely. It wouldn't have been here had they not imported it here. Right. Right. And we also know that they, whatever, we ain't going there. Because right, we're right, talking right. about being black men in America. Right. Right. So we we can't, you know, we can't, we we can, we can do whatever we want to do. But I mean, I think ideally affording, you know, we, we, we don't have the luxury of affording to sitting across the table and looking at each other and say, you less than, you ain't part of this. I don't care what level. If you LeBron That's or, correct. Or, or or you I forget the homeboy Larry Hoover. Yeah. We we can't we don't get that affordability because at the end of the day, Jay Z said it, you still nigga. All right. So how do we change this? Like I don't wanna I don't wanna walk out I, you know, I, how do we change this? I don't wanna lose a homie. Right. N- not I don't wanna lose my wife. I don't wanna lose my kid. Right. I don't want none of us. Right. So how do we how do we how do we change the policies of this country? So that we are independent. See, we got freedom. We're not independent. That's we correct. We ain't independent. That's correct. And I think majority of the country don't want us to have independence. See, we talked about that word need. Right, last week. Last, last week. week. That's right. right. They 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 want us to need them. Right. I don't know. I'm just throwing I, it out like there. I, like I don't I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I have the answers because I don't. But I would think that part of the solution is showing up in numbers i've learned this through my friend big tone he knows who he is shout out to him but and he's been on my back for years i'll tell y'all a story about him later when it comes to this what i'm about to say but he's been on my back for years and finally he got my attention story for another day but miguel i've seen it through his work is we got to show up in numbers to the voting box. Like, period. Like, you can't sit back and talk the talk, but when it's time to do the walking, you sit your behind at home. True story. I, I, I'm i with you. So, and I learned that from you, and I learned that from my man, Big Tone, and he knows who he is. I talk to him every night. That's my guy, my ace. So, that's the first part. Uh, the other part... Um, is just continuing to speak and and talk and educate and inform and direct because for many for many white people you know they don't they don't they don't know the sever they didn't know the severity of it right until they riding in the car with a homeboy who just happens to be black and and they get jammed up and they see the difference in treatment so continuing to inform and educate, I think continuing to have the conversation that, that I, I, and again, I'm just guessing here. Like I'm not even saying that this is part of it, but, or this is the answer, but you know, I would think that that has to be somewhere in that showing up in numbers. Oh yeah, bro. To the voting box. But here, here, I'm going to take you one past voting. And then I, continuing to have the conversations and educate. Let, let me take you one past voting. Cause I think, I, I think we fall victim to that, that rhetoric too. Cause I am that guy, right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure. going to do this. You know, we, we get, um, we get caught up in this. Oh, go vote, go vote, go vote, go vote, go vote, go vote. I get you. Did you vote? Did you vote? Cool. Did you know what you just voted for? 
Real talk. That's fact. How many of us actually go to the voting box and have talked to the person who is running for office? Right. How many of us have actually asked them if 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 black if equality in America is important to you? Did you ask? Because we live in Jeffersonville. That's so right. So if you're listening, I'm gonna pick on Jeffersonville. That's all right. Did you ask Matt Owen, who is our, our council president, if he supports black lives before you voted for him? Wow. Did you ask Scott Hawkins, I think that's his name. When he ran for city council at large, did he support black lives before you voted for him? Did you ask Dustin White, who's black, over District 1, did he support black economy, black lives, before we voted for him? Did we ask the mayor, Mike Moore? I know I did the first time he ran, and he said he had a campaign to win, and he hadn't thought that far in advance. Point I'm making. We can't just, there is power in voting. Just like the, voting is like money. And so often we piss it away. Wow. wow. We're going to spend some shit on a credit card hmm. with the hopes of getting a positive return. Ooh. We can't just get out there and blindly vote. I'm going to tell you right now, let a motherfucker call me talking about come vote for me. And my first words are, what policies are you going to change? How are you going to better the lives of us all, not just the sum? See, we, we getting caught up in this wealth conversation because that's important, too, mm-hmm. because, you know, most of most of a lot of these companies definitely locally in southern Indiana get government contracts from the city, from county commissioners, from where are the black businesses in our community and how are they thriving? How are they being supported? See, we want to vote, but the people we voting for might sign a collective bargaining agreement that allows police to get away with murder. Yeah, we got to vote. Teach, bro. Let me tell you what else we got to do. It is in our power and in our right as a citizen of this country, the county and city and state you live in, to seek office. Change doesn't happen unless you're at the table. That's right. You can do two things in this life. You can build your own table. We know that they will destroy it or attempt to. Or you can sit at their table and negotiate a better way. We know that if black people get equality, it helps everyone. Right. But there are those who don't see that. Right. We not only have to run for office, but we have to train our children to take that position. It ain't the Oreo move, right? <laughs> right, right, it right. Ain't the, it ain't the you ain't black enough move. Let right. me tell you, I'm so black I ran for office twice, and I knew damn well I probably wasn't going to win. Because I know I'm not going to ask anyone else to change the system for me when I know I'm capable of changing it myself. That's building your own table. Elim- eliminating that need. Absolutely. Which, so, which I'm part, going. No, it, I like it. I like it too. Uh, you know, how, how do we make that change? I think we have to figure out how to fundamentally change the mindset. That would be that I'm just going to vote along party lines because this party or that party has historically been beneficial to me as a person or as a black person. We have to show up, not just before the vote, but after the vote as well. True story. Show up to support our black businesses. We want, we want to know how they're thriving. How are we supporting them so that they thrive? So even if, if they get not one dollar in any kind of government assistance, we become the assistance. We make sure they thrive. That's an because excellent point. We, we show up. That's an excellent point. To ensure we want, we want to have economic wealth, then let's show up so that we can ensure that we have economic wealth the black dollar is one to 1.5 trillion dollars strong where are we all right holding our official our officials accountable not just because we voted them in but to the promises that they make which is the show up part after the vote and if they don't do what they said okay we know what we do next time around nah not even next time around see that's the problem we in this mode where we want to wait Fuck waiting for stuff. Excuse the language. I know everybody out there. I done dropped the <laughs> F-bomb a lot tonight. So, you know, if you want to send some money because I keep cussing and you want me to keep cussing, you know how to do it. Because uh, <laughs> his jar is full. And my jar is full, I right? It <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance for the little kids. Um, but, you know, Gelly mad. Uh, so <laughs> no, help. better yet, help me. Help me understand. Because we, okay, so check it out. Uh, uh. Let's 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 pick on Southern Indiana again because that's where we are, right? So right, if right, you're right, watching right. and you're in Southern Indiana, you know that I'm on one. Um, Here we are. So we have a state rep 
uh, by the name of Jim Lucas, who for since he's been in office has uh, made racial whatnots and epithets or whatever on his Facebook. Right. So do we wait to remove him from office? Right now, granted, no. his entire community is roughly predominantly Caucasian. And, that, you know, hey, that's cool. If they want that, they want that. But here's the thing. This guy's a state rep. What does he do? He writes policy for the state. The state. So if he thinks like that, what is he doing? Writing like policy that. for He's, like that. Boom. Yep. Right. So we we don't wait for that. Right. We got to rally against it now. Right. And demand that he's removed from office. Right. Right. There, I, I, I don't I don't have the answer to this, but I am going to find out because I want to know how do we have a sitting state senator or congressional person or city council person removed for being racist, for for perpetuating the systemic problems of this country? Well, I do know we had him removed as a group because a lot of us screamed and hollered um, with the help of the Legislative Black Caucus and them coming out and we rallied. And I think most of it had to do with um, the time that we're currently in. So he was removed from, com from committees because he was on some wealth committees. Right. I want you to understand that. Think about mm -hmm. that for a minute. Right. Let that breathe. Right, right, right. right. So we can't, we, we can't, we, we, we no longer can afford to wait to remove white supremacy. So- Right. Here's a challenge to our white friends. So when they say, hey, what can we do? We can, you, you can, and I know this white privilege thing, this might be another conversation. You know, maybe we'll get some of our white friends on here to have this conversation, right? Yeah. But we, we, right now, we're asking them to use their white privilege to fight white supremacy. Ooh. Use your white privilege, your tools, your resources, because it's your brother, your uncle, your cousin, your auntie to remove white supremacy. I'm not telling you to throw it away. I'm just telling you to get the hell out of the police force. I'm telling you to get off the city council. I'm telling you to get off the school board because they're teaching our children. Mm. What are they teaching our children? The same shit they taught us. We less than, we ain't good enough. Mm -hmm. How many black school books do you see in, in your schools currently in Southern Indiana that your children are learning that they are kings and queens and came from one of the wealthiest continents of the world? Right. Right? They Beach, were transported yeah. to this country so that Europe could gain wealth, Portugal, Spain, Great Britain, France. See, we, we ignore that part. We, when we talk about America, we talk about American slavery, we forget how we really got here right. and who played a major part in that positioning and still do. Let's be honest about that. South Africa does not belong to the colonizers, but I digress. Right. So right. now nah, we can't wait. I don't think we have to wait. I don't think we, I, I think, I think we have to organize. We got to use organizations like the NAACP. We have to use organizations like uh, the Indiana Democratic African American Caucus. We, we've got to use organizations that are in our community that exist and have existed for ages to fight this position. Right. But I don't think we wait. We have to get active every day. This has to be a way of life. Like you said, apathy. You're teaching me. You, you, really, you are. Because if we sit on the couch, if we're affected by racism every day. Right. And we sit on a couch and do nothing like it's not part of our life. Then it never changes. That's correct. It's kind of like That's somebody true. who is economically challenged. You said change your mindset. If you don't read a book, you'll always be illiterate. Right. Ooh. Real talk. Right. You, but you do have to be brave enough to ask somebody to teach you how to read. That's right. Money is no different. That's correct. So if you sit on your couch and you're economically challenged and you choose to stay that way, you choose not to learn, teach yourself, ask a question, YouTube how to redefine your economic position. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you always going to be in that same place. So what I'm saying is this, is that this has to be a way of life. For me, it's a way of life. We discuss this all the time in my home. Right. We're, we're involved, right? Always asking the hard question so much that sometimes they don't want me in the room. <laughs> right, right, right. But we as a people, black men, black women, our children, we have to make this a way of life. We don't all have to be militant. Right. But we, we have to make we have to make eradicating, removing, eroding systemic racism from our communities as a whole. But it has to be an everyday way of life. We can't ever go back. That's right. We cannot go ever go. That's just my opinion. But you also make a very good point that we even though we all can't be militant, there's there's a place for each one of us. As, That's correct. As trainer says there's levels levels to this. That's right. And my level may not be militancy, but my level, I can operate on the level that I'm at that I have. So that we all play, we all come together and play our, our roles, our, right. our, our place in this. And you're right, it does have to become a way of life. Because whether we sit on the couch and do nothing, or whether we're out in the streets protesting, it is, it is our life. True story. 
that's your kid. That's somebody's kid out there. That's your that's your neighbor. That's your neighbor's kid out there. Right. That's being met by military. Right. Yep. By military. Right. Because they were they were they were saying that you know after nine eleven you know police departments bulked up for the under the auspices of, of fighting terror and they're using all that equipment that they bulked up on against its own citizenry. Have they? But they always have. Real talk. Right. 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 So we got to we got to we got to manage that. We got to put some laws in place that says, hey, don't bring out a tank when you got a bunch of 18 year olds right. and, and, and booty shorts and tank tops oh. screaming F the police. Because that's what I saw when I was down there. Oh, OK. I, was, I saw a bunch of kids. Okay. I'm old now. So I get to say that. Well, I'm older now. Right. So no disrespect to my 25 and below my 30 and below. Sometimes I still say kid. Right, I get it now. When when they used to call me a kid at twenty five, yeah, you know, yeah, I yeah. Get it. You know what I mean? Real talk. So what I saw was young people out there screaming. At best, I ain't seen nobody with no M sixteens, no AR fifteens. There wasn't nobody down there that looked like me. Right. I might, you know, there might have been some people strapped. I don't know. I know I was, but I, you know what I mean. Wasn't nobody out there to do no harm. Right. Now, don't get me wrong. There was some rogue people in the midst. Yeah, the three things. We all saw the video. We know the truth. You know, there's three things when it comes to a protest. Whether you can protest, looting, and rioting comes along with it, mm -hmm. right? That's just civil unrest. Sometimes we need that to pay attention. But we also got to realize sometimes our opposition will put that in place so they can get what they want. Woo! Uh, what policies are you going to change? So right now, I think everyone, so for example, in Louisville right now, their CBA, their, their collective bargaining agreement is actually going to expire June 30th, right? So... Yeah. Allegedly, Greg Fisher, who was the mayor of Louisville, said that um, it is the responsibility of the elected of, of their state reps to negotiate this policy. Now, every state is different. All right. So I asked the question in Indiana. I was told that it was the mayor and the city council's responsible ability to negotiate the collective bargaining agreement in Indiana. But then I was like, well, who negotiates that for the state police? Aren't they managed by the government? I mean, the governor and our state reps. <laughs> right. So th there's a layer cake there. But yeah, what policies? So I think we have to start peeling back policies. Right. right? Mm -hmm. It's 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 open book, right? It's open policy. Right, for sure. You know, so maybe, maybe, okay, so let's start local. So if we're raving the flag and saying, hey, what do we do? Let's start local. Let's look at governance for policing in our own community. Right there, not, not at a national level, but right in a city level. So we know that the city of Jeff hired at least two of the cops who were under civil litigation yep. and had been questioned as it relates to uh, discrimination in policing. That's a violation. They all, there it is. That's a violation. That I like that. There it is. Now we know how to use it. Yep. Right? That's a violation. You, we, you asking for the trouble. Right. There you go. Mm -hmm. So maybe, may, may just maybe we ought to have a policy that says if an officer is under civil litigation for rape, racial discrimination, domestic violence, that they can't be hired in our community. Let that breathe. Wherever they come from, they got to move somewhere else. They got to go somewhere else. But they cannot be a cop in our community. So maybe that has to be part of the policy. That's right. If it's not there. That should well, we, be, got, we got to demand that. That should be across the board for every piece of government, every state, every fet, like those. Yes. What you just said. You know, so here, let, let's look at another policy. I mean, we can we can scale them. We can look at all of them. So let's let's talk about budgeting and spending policy. So if if I believe and I, I somebody out there can correct me later in, in, in life, but I believe that in the city of Jeff, uh, the population of African Americans is about fourteen or fifteen percent. I, I reserve the right to be wrong because I'm not looking at any, and I just pulled right. out my ass. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> here's the thing: Is the city of Jeff doing business when they spend money at a minimum? with 14% of their population. Wow. Or is 100% of those dollars being spent with the same people, the same families? Oh. The same layer cake. You're going deep now. Pause. Right? May, just maybe we ought to have a policy in place that speaks to distribution of wealth as it relates to tax dollars when we're doing construction, when we're giving away dollar buildings, Mm. Mm. When we're when we're when we're when we're signing off contracts for real estate, when we're doing eminent domain and, and we're and we're moving economically challenged people out and not giving them new opportunities. Right. I'm just saying when we're writing scholarships and giving scholarships away with government tax dollars that those people who wrote the scholarship and manage it don't cheat it 
and the people who are in the economically challenged areas that should be having access to it get it. So maybe we ought to have policies there. Then maybe we have to have local attorneys who are willing to sue the city and its officials for not following their governance. Right. So, I mean, those That's are starts. Those right. are just baby steps. School board, no different. So maybe we go to the school board, wherever your community is. And I'd love this to happen in white communities. Definitely predominantly white communities. Because we know that African-American history, which is American history, right. is not introduced in most of our schools. That's correct. So why not go get a book like Puss in Boots and introduce Pick Me, who is one of the, the, the world's most known graphic illustrators who's black, right? Or go find E.B. Lewis, and I can go on and on and introduce this to entry-level reading. There's, there's a librarian in Louisville, and I love her, Jen. Jen Koch, you're, you're greatest because I know she does that in her school, white lady, a uh, right. beautiful person. Right. I just said she was white, so the rest of the world knows. Um, but I don't really care. Amazing. And she does that. Right. Like she took it upon herself to find these books and said, man, I need to teach all my students, not just my black students. That's correct. That's correct. All my students. That's a word right there. So these are, these are baby steps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get a corporation that calls you and says, hey, I want to do something. All right, I'll change the policies of your company. Put your money where your mouth is and do business with black-owned business. You know, I, I called um, our, our city council member, and I said, hey, I want to do business with the city. All right? You know what he said to me? What? Are you certified? Because there's this thing that runs around where African-American or minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses can get certified to do business as a minority-owned business because there used to be this thing that set aside that was supposed to be created, and I'm going to summarize this real quick, to, to make the, the spending an equitable playing field. It pissed me off because I'm thinking in the world of a pandemic, white folks are doing business with no extra layer, with no extra paper, no extra need but what is basically called upon you to create a business right. and out his mouth rang. Are you certified? Still nigga. Real talk. Hey, look, bro. This That's is... this how this shit bothers me today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm done. I rap. Y'all, y'all come with me. Y'all, you <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Hey, listen. Man. Wow. You just, nah, put, you... you just put so much meat and potatoes out there on the table. Sure did. Well, I'm done. This is Gelly Gale, and this is Common Conversations with the Odd Fellas. If you like the podcast, if you like what you're seeing on Facebook, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, share, and or like. And if you're really digging it and you want me to keep throwing money into the money jar, that tip jar, go ahead and hit the donate button. You know what? It costs to make this thing happen, and we didn't ask you to pay to listen. But I am now. Let's go.